Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have photographer Brooke Di Donato as tonight's guest speaker. Originally from Ohio, Brooke is currently based in New York. After studying photojournalism at Kent State University, she embarked on a personal body of work questioning the notion of realism predicated by the photographic medium. Her series of self-portraits, A House is Not a Home, has been exhibited throughout the U.S. as part of Defense, and is included in the permanent collection at the Southeast Museum of Photography. Her work has also been exhibited internationally, most recently at Kindle Center for Contemporary Art in Berlin, and the Delphian Gallery in London. Commercial clients include Adobe, Huawei, Refinery29, and Coach. Please help me welcome Brooke Di Donato to our lecture series. Hi. <laughs> um, so thank you guys for coming, and thank you, SVA, for having me. So I thought I would start with the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I mean that quite literally. Uh, this is a photograph of my parents' bedroom, circa 1990. And for those of you who have already seen my work, uh, this sort of is like very reminiscent of like a, a set that you might stumble upon in one of my photographs. So as I was preparing for this lecture, I was reminded of this picture and I called up my mom. I was like getting on the train and, and I was like, mom, mom, um, do you remember that picture of, of you and my dad's, my, my dad's bedroom? And she's like, yeah, why? And I'm like, well, when, when was that picture? Like, was that, was that before, before I was born? So she's like, she's like, yeah, why, why are you asking about that photo? And I was like, well, I'm preparing for this presentation. And I was just like thinking, you know, that photo kind of looks like, kind of looks like the work I make now. And, and, you know, I was wondering if like maybe I was conceived like in this room <laughs> and, and like what a good story that would be. And she's like dead silent. And then she just starts laughing, and she's like, no, 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 you were conceived in a hotel. Uh, so, so moving on, um, a question that I get a lot of times is like, when did you decide to be an artist? And I can't say that there was like a defining moment, or at least I don't think there was, where I was like, I'm going to continue down this very exciting but unstable career trajectory. Um, but I found this report on me, aptly titled a uh, report on me. And if you go like three paragraphs down, you will see that it says, when I grow up, I would like to be an artist. Uh, so this was age nine. So now I know that, I guess, age nine, I decided to be an artist. And I know some of you have probably read farther along. And you'll see that, you know, I like playing video games. I like petting my cat. And you're wondering, like, who is this really cool nine-year-old? So we're just going to lay this to rest real quick <laughs> and moving on. So this is, um, this is where I'm from, not precisely here, but this is across the street from my dad's house where I grew up in uh, sort of like er suburban and rural Ohio. Um, and I never really thought of this as, like, particularly inspiring growing up. I kind of came to New York six years ago because I was like, I can't make interesting work in Ohio. I need to, I need to go somewhere else. I need to like move to a big city. I need to like meet new people. I need to step out of my, my comfort zone. Uh, little did I know that like Ohio would actually become the backbone for much of the work that I've been making for the last six years. So I started out, uh, studying photojournalism, which most of you probably know is essentially like the practice of telling stories with pictures. And I was in school at Kent State and I was really like interested in the arts and I heard about this major called photojournalism. And I was like, I'm going to sign up for that. I don't really know what that's about, but that sounds good. And I got into my, my one of my first classes called visual storytelling, which sounds pretty straightforward. Um, but I got into this class and I just like totally was out of my element. I had never really thought about telling a story in a single image. 
And in this class, like throughout the course of the year, we learned about all of these like very famous photographs. So we learned about like Nick Utt's Napalm Girl. We learned about John Philo's photograph from the Kent State shootings. And it was like the bar was so high and there was just like this massive gap between like what I what I wanted to do and what I was actually like capable of doing with my skill set. And I think um, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is like that gap. And that gap is really always there. And sometimes it sort of like widens and you're like, how am I ever going to get over there? And then sometimes it's, it's very narrow and you're like, I'm almost there. And then it widens again. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to get into. So looking for subject matter, uh, as I mentioned, I started returning home to my hometown in Ohio. And I started like noticing things that I had never noticed before. Uh, so this is my dad's toilet. Um, I've probably sat on this toilet hundreds of times, never thought much about it. But all of a sudden, coming back to Ohio, I was like, wow, this is, this is really interesting. Like The floor is carpeted, which has been pointed out to me so many times since then, which, which actually is kind of odd, but I uh, never thought about it again. And uh, I was really into this, the, this wallpaper. So I sort of like built this little setup in the bathroom and uh, just shot it with like window light. And then moving on from there, uh, I started getting into self-portraiture. Uh, it became like a really good way for me to get comfortable with my camera and also get comfortable, uh, I guess, like on both sides of, of the camera. There's sort of a lot to be learned through self-portraiture because you're, you're constant, the, the trial and error is like, you're so, you're so involved with it. And I think there are, there are certain aspects of like, you know, you, you can make an, a self-portrait that's bad and you look at it and you're like, oh, I look bad there, that's not working. But then working with models like down the road, it's like you maybe don't wanna be as like frank. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of like good, I guess, like foundation to be built from working in self-portraiture. Uh, so this was sort of like weighing in on the idea of like domesticity and sort of playing with the like the weight of these these ideals and uh, you know what society tells women that we should be doing. Um, and this sort of became part of a larger series that I'll show later. Uh, this is another self-portrait I, I, in a cactus. <laughs> I don't work in self-portraiture quite as much as I used to, but then there are certain things like this where I'm like, I couldn't possibly ask someone else to do that. Uh, this was taken in Austin, Texas last year. I was visiting my friend and we were walking through the, the park and I saw the way the light was hitting these cac this cactus patch and I was like, do you think I can get in there? And She's like, please don't. Like, I, I know people here. That's just super uncomfortable. Um, so I went back the next day. I put on some extra layers of clothing, which didn't really do much. Like, I still had a lot of cactus needles in, in my body, but I think it was, you know, sort of worth it. Um, so then moving on from there, I started photographing other people. This is my partner. And she used to really love doing this stuff. I think she's, uh, she's here, and I think she really is not a fan of this anymore. <laughs> but uh, this was, uh, I went to Europe for the first time this summer and we were in Italy and we were staying in this like Airbnb situation. And uh, so there were other people and we had this like moment where no one was in the hallways and I was like, get in. And we just rolled her up real quick. <laughs> um, so thankfully we got it on the first roll cause the, you know, could have gotten awkward. Um, this is another uh, picture of her in, this was taken in, uh, in Seoul, in South Korea. And then moving on from there, uh, Instagram has become a really great way for me to like meet other people who are interested in modeling, to collaborate and uh, things like that. And this was actually a florist who I met with uh, a few months ago. And I like sh I showed up at her. I do a lot of stuff with flowers, which you've I don't you've seen already. But uh, she I showed up at her apartment. She just had like this buffet of this a massive arrangement of like beautiful flowers, like I've never seen before. 
and I really did not know what we were going to do with them, and then we sort of just threw them all on her, and uh, this is a video. Okay, well, you look it up and just tell me it'll just make it easier. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, text you when I'm on the way. I'll just hop in a cab. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love you. So it's the behind the scenes of these are pretty funny because she's like, I'm going to hop in a cab. And I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> so and then this was the finished image. So obviously a lot of the flowers and such were toned in post. I do a lot of like digital painting on top of the images. And um, that was that one. And, and then um, this is another behind the scenes. And then this was the image we made that day. OK, so going into the, like I guess, foundation of this presentation, I'm going to sort of touch on three different things. Um, one of them is places. So where do you look for inspiration? Places are a huge part of the work I've been making for the last six years. Uh, I spent a lot of time like wandering around, scouting locations, and then kind of building a narrative on top of that. So back to the cornfield across from my dad's house. So this is this was taken in winter, obviously. And then here in 2011, this is the the first self-portrait I ever made in this in this place. Um, you can see it looks much different than the work that I just showed you. And I've kind of like composited four different versions of myself together. Uh, I turned the photo black and white, which I maybe wouldn't do now. And then I kind of added this like weird like texture on top of it. So this was during uh, a time I was still in college at the time. And I had just started making self-portraits and was doing a project where I challenge myself to make one conceptual image every day for a year. So this was during that time period. And moving on, you'll see this is a year later in 2012, and I'm back at this location. This time, I've brought a prop with me. I've shot it at like a lower angle. There's sort of some weird like red haze that I've added, uh, more textures up top. And I'm really just trying to like make an interesting photograph at this place. So going on to 2013, and I'm here again. It's winter now, and I, again, I'm not really sure what I'm trying to do, but I'm, I'm going back to this place again, and I'm trying something again. 2013, same thing. This time, I roped one of my friends in. Um, the cops actually stopped for this, which is very uncharacteristic of shooting in Ohio. And they were like, are you OK, ma'am? And I <laughs> and, uh, was like, yeah, it's just an art project. So um, this was actually uh, very, you can see, atmospheric because this was December, but it was unseasonably warm. So there was like all this really great fog that rolled in. And it, it just totally changes like the feel of this place. So 2014, I'm here again. Um, I made some strange headpiece out of balloons. I really, there's like sort of an unspoken understanding, I think, with the neighbors who actually own this property, <laughs> where like they don't call the cops on me and I quietly leave when I'm done <laughs> shooting self-portraits. Um, sometimes I bring my dad with me and he just sort of like stands there because it, it makes me feel like more uh, secure, I guess, with what I'm doing. Um, so then moving on, 2016, um, I made this weird like telescope thing. I don't know, we have some birds going on up here. Um, I'm just like really trying to make a good picture in this place. But you can see that like in every photograph, I'm not really like engaging with the place. I'm actually using the place as just a backdrop. So I'm just kind of like showing up with whatever I think of and I'm just using the, I'm not really utilizing like the location. So then moving on to 2017, and I finally make something that maybe feels a little bit more authentic to the first images I showed you, where I'm kind of actually engaging with the place. Uh, 
I also happened to catch the corn before it was cut down, which was lucky. Um, so the next thing is subjects. So what do you like to photograph? Um, so I think if you, any of us, if we look through our camera rolls on our phone, maybe it's like your dog, maybe it's like your child, uh, maybe it's interiors, whatever it is, there's like a, something that you're constantly seeing that other people are not seeing or they're seeing it different than you are. Uh, so as I started to return home to Ohio, I started noticing things like this. This is my mom's old couch and I, again, never thought much of it. And then I was, as I was returning home, I was like, oh, this is actually interesting. Uh, I like this. So in 2011, I made one of my first self-portraits there. Uh, there's a levitating teapot. I was really into levitating. I was like making everything levitate at this point. And I also consider this my, my prom dress period because I was like wearing my prom dress for almost every photo. And my mom was so amped. Like she's like my 21 year old daughter like still loves her prom dress. Uh, so she's like, yeah, it was a good investment. Um, so this was one of, the first, one of the first things I did there. And then again, 2012, not sure what's happening here, but you know, I'm cutting up old stuffed animals and sort of like trying to make something interesting here. And then in 2012, all of a sudden the couch becomes the background. It's not like the main thing anymore. It's actually something secondary to the main subject. And so now I'm sort of like getting into something interesting. And this photograph is uh, actually became the first image in a series, which I'll come back to later. Uh, so another object is this dollhouse that my grandmother gave me. And it's, it's very like, it's very ornate. There's all these little like mini um, pieces of furniture and like little knickknacks that we decorated together. And uh, one day in like 2011, I dusted it off and I moved it to the front of my dad's house and like stuck my head in it and, you know, made this picture and then ne literally never picked up that dollhouse again for years. 2014, I dust it off again and I start just photographing it, this time from the interior and kind of playing with scale and looking at how um, these, these diff like the weight of these different uh, objects in this space. And so moving on to 2016, and I'm now sticking my head in this dollhouse again, but from a different angle. And the idea for this photo was I saw it as being like a closing image to this series that I was working on at the time, which I'm gonna show you guys an overview of in a second. Uh, but I really just like had this idea in my head and I was like, no, this is the closing image for this series. I have to get this. So I, I basically shot this in Ohio in my dad's front yard and I brought it back to New York and I started just like going around every single edge of this dollhouse in Photoshop to turn it blue because I was like, I need to, it needs to, it needs to look a certain way. You'll understand in a second. But uh, so I'm like sitting there at my desk for maybe like eight, nine hours, like trying to like match up this, this color blue to the color of my dad's house. And I'm also trying to like fill in these trees in the background because it's, it's very clearly winter, like there's no foliage back there. So I'm like sitting there with the clone stamp and my partner comes home, like I'm, I'm seriously like 10 hours in and she's like, what are, you, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just making this house blue and you know, I'm like making it spring back there and everything and, and she's like, why don't you just go reshoot it? And that seems really obvious, right? Like I should just go reshoot it, but I think like, as artists, like we just never want, we're like, what did you just say? Like, did you just say that you want me to go, go back there and reshoot it? And it's like this, you're almost like offended. And um, I think like that's something that has been really, uh, really beneficial for me to become more comfortable with the last few years is like, instead of just like moving forward, like stopping and actually being like, what are we doing here? Could we have done that better? Can we go back? Can we make it better? And uh, that's just been like invaluable, I think, to the, to the work that I've made recently. Uh, you know, with clients, like you don't really have that luxury. Like it's like, oh, this is due, so you, you maybe can't go back. But with personal work, I just think there's really no reason you can't like go make it the best version of the thing 
that it can be. Um, so I did go back to Ohio. I painted the house. I shot it in harder light, and this ended up being the finished image in the series. And this was, this is sort of like an overview of the entire series, which is uh, called A House Is Not A Home. And they're all self-portraits, basically shot in some kind of like suburban backdrop. And they're sort of playing with the idea of female hysteria, which for those of you who don't know, it's a very antiquated diagnosis that was given to the hysteric woman. And sort of um, the idea of the series is like she sort of becomes more and more hysteric as the series goes on. And then the final image is the image of the head in the dollhouse. Um, so these photographs were recently exhibited at the Kindle in Berlin. And the moment of satisfaction was seeing this blue house in this little corridor and knowing that I actually went back and painted it. So the sort of final, uh, I guess, overview thing we're going to talk about is concepts. So, you know, what are you trying to say? A few years ago, probably like 2014, I got really into the idea of melting. And I was like, I want to see people melting. I want to see objects melting. I just want to like enter a room where everything is melting. And uh, this is my friend Ray. He used to work at the coffee shop that I uh, would spend eight hours a day at not buying things. Sorry, Ray. Um, <laughs> and he, I asked him to model one day. I was like, I have this idea. I'm going to make your face look like it's melting. He's like, that sounds cool. Count me in. Um, and he came over and my partner helped me make this uh, material out of like wax paint. So you basically heat it up, you melt it, we dripped it off the side of the table and then you can actually peel it off and it becomes just like an object that you can pick up and kind of move anywhere. So we pigmented it like something close to his skin tone and then the drips that are kind of like on his chin were just achieved in, uh, in post-production. So this was sort of like my first my first take on this and then uh, a couple months later I was on the internet and I found these and I was like what are these I need them they were like six dollars I ordered them from like Wisconsin and I couldn't find them anywhere else on the internet I could only find these six so I'm still convinced that I have like the last six rose candles on earth <laughs> And uh, because of that, I was like, I can't, well, I can't melt them. Like, you know, once I melt them, they're gone. So what am I going to do? So I did nothing. And I just kept them for maybe like a year. And at the time, I was, I was assisting a photographer uh, full time. for I did that for like three years. And I, had, I was spending like the whole day. I remember it very vividly. I was retouching portraits of lawyers. And I was like six hours in or something, like just, you know, fine tuning every little bag and wrinkle. And uh, I was like, I just got to like do something. Like I, I just need to make something. And my roommate at the time was, he was hanging out in the, in the kitchen. And I went in there and I was like, hey, would you, would you be willing to just like sit for a test? And he's like, sure, I'm not a model. And I'm like, no, it's okay. No one is like, just, you know, come in. So he comes in my bedroom and I have this gallon of fake blood and I'm like I'm just gonna douse him in it see what happens but I go to pour it on him and it's like totally like water it's just so thinned out that there's like nothing you can do with it so I go into the kitchen I start like mixing all this stuff into it like flour honey whatever I can to thicken it and it starts to look a lot like this pink wax so I clear off a wall and sort of like strategically place these little drips of wax on him and set the rose candle on top and sort of made this image. Um, so this became a series and I did an open call on Instagram. So most of the people I, I didn't really know well and they just kind of, the really great thing about this series was that people actually were like showing up at my apartment ready for me to melt wax on their bodies. And I was like, that is such dedication. I mean, um, so there, everyone was a, like a little disappointed, I think, when I had to, you know, tell them that it wasn't actually wax and it was some weird mixture I was making in my kitchen. Um, but nonetheless.
So moving on from there, uh, still did not get the melting out of my system and started thinking more about objects melting. So this was a this is a phone, obviously, and I use the same mixture that I did for the roses. It's just poured onto the phone and then the liquefy, I'm, I've done a little bit of liquefy on the top, as you can see. And then I started thinking about shoes melting. And I had this, this is a very bad drawing. You can see that I'm, there's a reason I use photography and not a pen. Um, so I showed this to my partner who, who makes a lot of like three dimensional stuff. And she really had to see the potential in it. But uh, uh, I was like, I want to make heels, a stiletto heels melting. And I don't want to do it in Photoshop. I want to be able to like pick this thing up and move it anywhere. Like I want to put it on a stretch of sidewalk. I want to put it in my bedroom. I want to put it anywhere. And so she started working with me and we used uh, like some resin and some, uh, that's right, right? Resin, yeah? yeah. <laughs> the resin. We used resin and uh, then we sort of cut into the heels and created these different like formations. And this is the finished piece which was then photographed. Uh, so I guess another thing I wanted to leave you guys with, especially those of you who are still students, is that like sometimes the medium can change too. It's like sometimes the thing you're trying to show, like maybe you're not working in the right medium and that's okay too. Like it's okay for something to start out as a photo idea and then become a video idea or then become a sculpture idea. And I think uh, sometimes those, th those ideas are like really overwhelming because we want to be consistent and and you know we have like we are holding ourselves to these standards but it's like that's sort of like I feel like one of the most liberating things I've learned in the last year is just like it's okay to like let this switch gears and so I'm going to show you guys another example of that which is uh, this photograph which um, I shot at my dad's house again and uh, I sort of just like draped myself over this fence and made this self-portrait and for years I just like wasn't really sold on this image. Like I, I never really liked that it was in black and white, especially as I started working in color more. Um, the composition like always felt a little off to me and there were just things like I really wish I could change about it. But the idea of like going back and just doing the same exact thing without like any progression really kind of irritated me. So uh, about a, maybe about a year or so ago, I ended up making a video. And this just sort of like loops into eternity. And obviously, I cut the audio so you couldn't hear me like moaning and groaning. <laughs> My dad was actually on a walk for this one and he came home and I was just like really, it's like embarrassing, right? Like I'm like, you can't see me in the middle of my process. Even though he sees it on the internet, he's like, yeah, that's my fence. Like who else do you know with that fence? But um, so the little like trade secret was I actually put a, like a rug under my stomach and then sort of like went on top of the rug, but it's, it's still painful. Um, so. Everything I've showed you guys thus far is personal work, and so I'm always asked, like, how do you make money? So I thought, <laughs> so I, thought I would show you guys some client work as well. Um, this, is a, this is a shoe campaign that, well, this is one image from a shoe campaign that I shot this summer for a company in Berlin, and it was very fun. They sent me just like a large box of shoes and they were like shoot the campaign you do everything and I was like oh that sounds great um, but then I was like oh my god I'm like styling this thing and I'm catering it and producing it and it was like definitely a learning experience but very fun nonetheless um, the other thing that I hadn't really accounted for with this shoot is that like fall campaigns are shot in the summer they're not shot in the fall so uh, I had everyone outside in New York City in like 98 degree weather in full fall clothing shooting fall. Um, these shoes are not very fall though, I will say. 
And then also like the task of turning everything the right shade of fall. Um, so that was, that was also fun. And we shot these almost all in uh, Highland Park, which is in Queens. Um, so another type of work that I do is editorial. So it's like somebody approaches me with just an idea and I'm sort of in charge of, I guess, finding a way to illustrate that visually. So this was a image that I made as part of a series for Refinery29 last year and it was for Mental Health Awareness Month and it was, it was honestly probably my favorite assignment to date because I feel like there's already, I feel like mental health is very entwined in the work that I'm already making so it was just like when they contacted me I was like yes like I need this I need this assignment uh, so we went out and shot these kind of around New York and in a studio and the concepts were um, like postpartum depression uh, schizophrenia and um, what was the other there was a like empathy like em like uh, stigmas around mental health and how we can sort of ship that and so they didn't really like make me say, oh, this photo is depression, like this photo is anxiety, which was really great. So they, I just sort of built a body of work around the concept. And then sort of the other piece of how I make a living is licensing. So sort of taking work that I made for my personal portfolio and syndicating it for other uses. So this was for a novel by Shirley Jackson. And um, you know, it's funny because my dad's gonna be really happy about how many times I mentioned him. But he, this was another one that like I shot at his house and he was like, get in the house, Brooke, like what are you doing? And the neighbors came out and, and now he like sees this and he's like, I did that, I made that photo happen. And I'm like, okay, dad. So he's like trying to take credit for stuff now. But, um, and then this is a editorial. So this is another example of licensing. Um, this was an article, this was about, uh, this was also about mental health and it was for um, the German version of, um, I actually can't remember the name, Myself I think is the name of the magazine. So I always throw this in here, I'm not like a super gear centric person. Um, my, most of my setups are very minimal. Um, maybe I'll use like a fill light here and there if I'm like shooting in a studio or if the you know, when I shot the shoe campaign, it's like the light was really uncontrollable. So um, I have a like Sony RX1 and A7 R2, which actually has been revolutionary because I can now use my phone as a remote and get into cactus patches. Mm -hmm. uh, before it was like everything was on a 10 second timer and I would come home with like 80 photos that aren't usable. Um, and then a tripod, and then I edit mostly in Adobe Photoshop and Lightroom, and then, you know, obviously the video stuff was, or the video was in uh, Premiere. And yeah, so, and also to students, like, yeah, you do, you do not need a lot of gear to, like, go make interesting work. So I wish somebody had told me that when I was a student. I wish somebody had been like, you can just go make things. Um, so I'm telling you that now. Um, so sort of like the summary, I guess, of all of this is it's okay to be repetitive because you will still change. This entire presentation is repetition. Um, I've showed you guys like, you know, six years of like doing the same thing and maybe you get like one or two good things out of it. Uh, inspiration is everywhere. I remember feeling like I had to like go to Italy and I had to like go to all these exotic places like go to New York. Um, not that New York is exotic to some of you who are from here, but uh, to me it was. And uh, it's like, again, most of the work I've made that I'm most proud of is, is from where I grew up. Uh, keep practicing, you'll still get better and don't be afraid to fail. Uh, sometimes this, this is just like a photo that I took on the street 
in New York, turns into another one of my very famous sketches, <laughs> um, and then turns into this, a work in progress. and turns into this. So that is what I will leave you guys with. Thank you. Hi, uh, I just really love your work. I saw that cactus picture on Instagram like several years ago and I told my friends she must be really good at Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> now I understand you just like really <laughs> has a very high level of paying tolerance. <laughs> uh, I was like curious about your editing uh, like habit because I noticed like from like 2016 your color palette just like changed and like the tones are different. I'm just wondering how did you find that and like what kind of things helped you? Thanks. Yeah, so the question was uh, that my editing style has changed a lot and that uh, sort of like how that happened, like the progression of that. Um, so I think it happened probably mostly through trying a lot of different styles. Uh, I, used to, I was really into like black and white photography for a while and then I sort of started trying more things with like a, like a sepia tone and then like textures and I sort of like went through all these different phases until I found my thing, I guess. And even when I found my thing, it still has like shifted. So like I noticed certain patterns and like things that I'm attracted to. Like for a while I was really into like really deep blues and now I'm into like cooler, lighter blues. So I think like some of that shift is like natural and I wouldn't like, I don't like hold myself to like a color wheel. It's not like I have like a Brooke Donato color spectrum that I like put up and I'm like, where are we going on this? Um, I do notice I don't, I'm not into yellow right now or like ever. <laughs> so, so I'm like, maybe that will change. So you, you might have like a couple core, core rules I think you stick to, but um, yeah, I think it's like just creating constantly and you'll sort of see that aesthetic pro like progress shift. Hi, Brooke. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Um, my question, you mentioned about uh, Refinery29 coming to you with that editorial piece. Is it b between editorial and advertising, are they always coming to you? Are you finding them? Can you talk a little bit about that process? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so the Refinery29 thing, and I'm not sure actually if this happened, but in my mind, I always like think maybe. Uh, I actually had reached out to them a couple times in the past and it sent them my portfolio, and I never heard anything, but I was like, they got it, you know, maybe they're just keeping me on for the right thing. So uh, I do wonder if, like, maybe, you know, those things do happen where it was like they sat on it for a couple years and then they came to me. Um, but they actually, when they did approach me, they approached me for a different project, and it was, like, really just sort of a strange fit. I, I can't remember what it was, but it just didn't really make sense, I think, and I ended up kind of, like, you know, framing a nice email that was like, oh, I'm not sure about this. And then they were like, oh, how do you feel about Mental Health Awareness Month? And that's sort of how that came to be. Um, same thing with like the shoe company. They initially expressed interest, but then it actually fell through for a year. And when I went to Europe, um, I actually scheduled a meeting with them and we were able to like meet in person and actually talk about ideas. And I think that kind of like sealed the deal when we realized we were like on the same page and we kind of had like the same vision for the campaign. So it's a little bit of like, you know, maybe a little bit of luck, like someone comes to you, but I definitely do try to, like I have a list of like dream clients and I don't think you should be hesitant to like reach out to those people and like send them your portfolio and be like, this is what I do. Yeah. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, so first quick question, how did you get into that cactus? Because that looked really <laughs> impossible. 
Um, Without getting well, hers. it was sort of. So what you can't see in that photo? Should I backtrack? It was like, eh. And you guys are gonna hate me when you're editing this because you have to yeah. take. I'm sorry, <laughs> but. Wow, it's like I just saw my whole life flash before my eyes. Okay, so if you look like over here, it's like, see how it's like a little bit lackluster? Well, this was, this was actually like a whole area of like deadness. So what I did was I found a stick actually just like lying around and I actually felt sort of bad doing this, but I actually just like pushed the dead part down more and then like, did one of these, like a giant, like just a giant leg over. And then from there, it was like very limiting with what I, with what I could do. Uh, I actually shot one version of this without a shirt and immediately was like, that's not happening and put the shirt back on. So um, yeah, it was just sort of like very intricate movements. Nice. And um, the other question that just came to my mind was when you say you submitted a was it a portfolio is your term? Uh, to, to, to like clients. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Like a PDF. Yeah. Yeah. Like what do you, cause I got to go struggle with this. Like, do you just s submit a link, like pretty much email them with a link to your website or you just said you make like a PDF? Like how, how do you go about, cause with the digital age, like, you know, some people are like, Oh, make a book and drop this off at, you know, but it's like, I don't know. How do you um, go about I think you should make, I mean, I usually make a PDF and I make it catered to what I'm trying to get from that client. So like I wouldn't send, you know, I don't know, like I wouldn't send this image to like certain publications, but I might send it to others who do like more conceptual things. So I think you want to kind of gauge your audience. Like if you're really interested in like shooting por a certain type of portraiture for a certain magazine or a certain like agency, I think you should like cater within your portfolio and sort of send them the images that are most relevant. I wouldn't just like send someone a catch-all website, if that makes sense. You're welcome. Hi, um, I think your work is so beautiful and unique because I can say your work ha ha has your own style. I, my question is, uh, how do you find yourself and how do you build your own style in photography? Was it how, how do I how do you find yourself? Yeah, and how do you build your own style in photography? Um, I think kind of like keep your head down and just keep making the stuff you want to see because they're like I didn't invent this, you know. There were like people who did surrealism way before me and there are like tons of influences in my work that like I probably don't even know about. So I think for me it was just like keep your head down, like kind of have blinders and just like keep making the work you want to make. And then eventually I think through sort of like that trial and error that we were talking about and like building on those skills and also building on your vision, I think I guess the aesthetic or like the style, it kind of just like reveals itself. But But it's not like oh, this is what I, 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 I never woke up and was like, I want to be a surreal conceptual photographer. I just knew I was interested in that medium. So um, just like practice and then like kind of checking in and being like, where are we? And then practicing again and then sort of like checking in, if that makes sense. Hi, Brooks. Thanks so much for your time tonight. Uh, I really enjoyed hearing about where your influence comes from a uh, place of personal experience, but sort of to piggyback off that last question, um, are there other artists in different media that you're looking at or other things that influence you? Like uh, you mentioned surrealism. Uh, yeah, well, uh, Magritte was probably like one of the first artists that I found where I was like, oh my God, like this is, it just like, t like his work totally blew my mind. I think, um, you know, I had like a period of images that I didn't show here where I was like really hitting the bowler cap like hard. Like I was just like, I probably should have put that in here, but I was just like, I'm putting a bowler cap in every photo these days. Um, but then again, like those influences do, I think, sort of shift. Uh, Gregory Crudson is another one that comes to mind that was like, I sort of love like how 
much nothing is happening in his images, but they're still like so suspenseful, you know? You're sort of just like placed in the middle of this storyline and um, they're all very familiar. Like they're really familiar locations, but there's something like so otherworldly about them. And I think that's something that I've definitely like tried to bring into my work where it's like, you know, an everyday sit, like a cactus patch is not necessarily exotic. I mean, I guess it is depending on where you're from, but it's like we know what it is. And so taking those things and kind of like shifting the perception of them has been really interesting to me. Um, I'm curious about licensing your personal work for commercial use and do you license anything in your portfolio or are there things that are off limits? Do you experience any tension given that you show in fine art venues? You know, how do you navigate that? Um, so I, I do have certain things that are off limits. I started working, I, I basically handled all of my licensing on my own for like five years and that was really great because it just like teaches you the language and it teaches you sort of like um, pricing, like all these things, and that was great too because I also handled, I was able to say no to things. Like I was just like, nope, that's not, we're not doing that, we're not licensing that. Um, now I work with an agency in Paris who, who helps me out with it, but it took a long time for me to like build that relationship where it was like, I trust these people and I trust that they're going to make sure that whatever use is done with these images is like tasteful. Uh, I still do put limits on some of them. Like anything that I sell as uh, like a, a print at like a gallery or something, I, I limit like their usage to only editorial. Um, so, you know, and I, it's funny too because like every year, what, I think when you make new work, when it's like fresh in your mind, it's really precious to you, right? Like you're like, no one can touch this. Like we, we can't make money off of this. It's so beautiful. Like, and it's funny because then like by the next year, I'm like, ah, yeah, sell it. You know, so so it's kind of funny, like how that shifts um, as you keep as you, you mean you're like young, you're making new work all the time. So that that idea kind of you let go a little. So, but yeah, certain things I certain things I don't. So. Okay. Thank you so much, Brooke. Yeah. Thank you.